I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to the continuing 200th anniversary celebration of Massachusetts General Hospital. And we want to extend a warm thank you to MGH for co-sponsoring this series. We're in for a treat today, and I would like to have our uh, assistant program director, Zara Jacob, introduce our speaker. Thank you. So welcome again. Uh, joining us today is MGH's own Dr. Warren Zapol, Emeritus Anesthetist in Chief and Director of the MGH Anesthesia Center for Critical Care. He'll be discussing the evolution of technological innovations that have increased patient comfort and survivability during surgery. 165 years ago, Massachusetts General Hospital was the location of the first surgical use of anesthesia in the surgical theater now known as the ether dome. However, today many new techniques are being employed to aid in surgical procedures. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Warren Zapel. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for coming. Let me say that I will focus on a period 150 years ago. I really want, I wanted to take this op, op, opportunity in this very special place to talk about the beginning of it all, how it begun, who did it, and I think you'll find it's very amusing and very interesting and very perplexing. And here we are, 165 years later, and people are still writing books about it. And as I will tell you, Ether Day is the book to read by Julie Fenster. I'll show you a picture of the cover at the end. And I brought an ether vaporizer, not modern technology, but the technology that we'll talk about today. This is what William Thomas Green Morton used to anesthetize the first patient. I just thought you'd like to see what it looked like. Things look different when you hold them, when, when you see them on slides, but we'll go through some slides. It'll take me about 30 minutes, plus or minus five, and then we can have some time for comments. So what was life like before October 16th, 1846? This is what we think it was like. When you had to have surgery, you faced agony. Surgery was kind of grouped into three areas, removing things from your skin and face and arms and hands, little tumors, people could do that. There was something called lithotomy or removing stones from your bladder. And there was amputations, a capital surgery when we took a leg off or an arm off. And one took it off in 60 to 90 seconds and the anesthetic was usually a swig of brandy, maybe a few drops of opiate, opium, a morphine, family agent. And then they took you to some place with very thick walls, far away from everybody else in the hospital, and in 90 seconds they did the job. And if it took more than 90 seconds or 120 seconds, the patient sunk, S-U-N-K as it was written in the medical record, and they carted you out. Most people, when faced with this, here's an amputation of the lower left leg, either disappeared quietly from the doctor's office, or in many cases committed suicide. Facing this and speaking to people who had lived through this was so awful that at the Mass General Hospital, that little building by Bullfinch that you passed, perhaps as you walked here, we did one operation a week. One operation a week. Today, there are about 100 on the main OR schedule, plus we do 50 anesthetics in various other places. We're doing about 150 general anesthetics, and as I walked over, I thought, who knows how many local anesthetics Hundreds, perhaps, maybe a thousand, I don't know, in one hospital. So surgery was held back to the 90-second limit, maybe 120-second limit, for several hundred years as it tried to develop, and therefore it couldn't. You didn't have time to perform surgery, whatever you did, tie an artery, 
so awful a leg had to be done in 90 seconds. The field was stymied. And then two events occurred, and I'll talk about one of them here today, that changed the world. And this one happened in Boston. Those events were Listerian antisepsis and the proving to the world that general anesthesia worked, could, could happen. We'll talk about the general anesthesia story. What are the roots? Doesn't like me. Okay. So ether discovered as a substance probably around 1350 in the Middle Ages by some monks. Wasn't used for very much. Uh, maybe put it, the people put it on gums to cool them as it evaporated. Nitrose oxide was discovered N2O by Joseph Priestley, brilliant man. He also discovered oxygen in about 1770 in England. Priestley, 1770, and then along came Sir Humphrey Davy, born in Cornwall, Wall, a smart, a smart inventor, scientist of the time, worked mainly with nitrose, N2O, nitrose oxide. And he was chosen to head Beddoe's Pneumatic Institute, a funny place in England, at about 1800, the Pneumatic Institute in Clifton, where the thought was that maybe if one inhaled these funny gases, you could conquer the, one of the main killers of the time, which was tuberculosis. And Sir Humphrey Davy really got into nitrous oxide, which had only been discovered 30 years old earlier. He was a good inventor. He invented the Davy lamp, so useful for miners. But he also got into nitrose oxide, started to inhale it himself, and wrote a 400-page book, of which we have just a little bit. Eh, this is nasty. OK, wherein he said, as he scribbled along in this 400 book, 400 pager, it may probably be used with advantage in surgical operations. Not a bad guess. Pretty good idea. We still use nitrous oxide today. Thousands and thousands of liters of it. However, scientists publish books, and kids and young people like to play with drugs, as you know. And today, people smoke pot. But between 1800, when Sir Humphrey Davy himself becoming addicted to this strange gas, and they used it very poorly. They made it in various qualities. They didn't realize you also had to breathe oxygen. It wasn't clearly worked out. And so people started to have these nitrous parties here in Boston. So people from 1800 to 1846, the time we're going to talk about, the day, the important day, started to play with gases. And they played with nitrous oxide. And probably here, or in the theater next door, people started to have nitrous parties. And the man, Samuel Colt, the man who developed the Colt revolver, the multi-chamber revolver, got very interested in this stuff too. Uh, and people started to pay money to go to see other people act silly. And here is one such event. A uh, laughing gas party would be given in the Masonic Hall and on the 15th of November in 1845, 10 gallons of gas will be made. Men will be invited from the audience to come up here and breathe it, and then you'll do silly things as your mind is partially anesthetized by nitrous oxide. So over at the Mass General, they're sawing off legs in 90 minutes, and over here, people are breathing funny gases to produce funny effects for show purposes. Gas was minute only to gentlemen of the first respectability, though, of course. This was going on. People were making lots of money with demonstrations of funny gases. Along comes a dentist. Now, dental surgery was really going on. People were ripping out teeth and rotten teeth and various things. People were having toothaches. And a guy by the name of Wells in Hartford, Connecticut, went to one of these demonstrations. And the guy next to him got up and had the gas 
paraded off the stage, fell 12 feet, whatever it was, eventually sat down limping next to him, and uh, he looked at his leg, and he said, how's your leg? He pulled up his pants. He had this big hematoma. He said, did you feel it? And I said, no, I didn't feel it at all. It didn't bother me at all, falling off the stage. Hmm. Put two and two together, went home, tried it on himself, right? In those days, if you had a good idea, you tried it on yourself. And Wells had his own tooth. He had a rotten tooth pulled. He breathed the gas from the bag, had his tooth pulled out, and said, wow, when are you going to pull a tooth out? And I said, oh, no, we already pulled it out. So Wells got into nitrous oxide. Now, our hero, William Thomas Green Morton, young man who was a total con man, right? He'd, been, he'd passed bad checks. He'd been thrown out of three states for passing bad checks and doing all kinds of things. Claims he went and got a dental degree in Baltimore. Claims, but there's no evidence. Ends up as a partner to this guy. And Wells, who's well ahead of him in his thoughts, says, let's go try it in Boston. You know, we'll show the world that they can do surgery with this stuff. And so they come up to the MGH, right? There are very few cities with hospitals at that time, New York, uh, Philadelphia, Boston were the famous ones. He comes up here, he tries a demonstration of it. And if I can get this thing to work. He goes to the ether dome where we're going to see the ether demonstration. And he tries it, comes in, and there's a medical student with a bad tooth. So the medical student sits down. Wells doesn't have a, a place to make nitrous oxide here, so he goes to a chemist on Beacon Hill. They make him a bag of something. He gives it to the medical student, and the medical student goes, ah, when he pulls the tooth. And all the surgeons look at him, and they said what you said in Boston when you didn't believe something in 1846. You said, bah, humbug, right? So in his ears, bah, humbug, and, you know, Wells was a broken man after failing to demonstrate the anesthetic properties of nitrous oxide. Terrible, because today it's still used. It's, it works, partially. It's weak. It's not as strong as ether, but it does work. And along comes on our hero, the con man. He's 27 years old at the time that he does the demonstration of ether, just to give you an idea of how young he was. He'd already been thrown out of at least three cities, Rochester, Cincinnati, and some maybe Kansas City. He'd worked for a little while selling things on Mississippi River boats, then gets into the dentistry game. He's pretty successful pulling teeth, is a partner of Wells, comes to Boston and starts thinking, how could I use a stronger thing? And he meets this strange and wonderful man. This story is full of strange and wonderful people from Boston. This guy was Charles Jackson, MD, a famous physician, really a geologist inventor. He had studied the rocks in New England. He was as strange as they came. And he once said, if anything worthwhile was going to be invented, I would invent it. I would have done it. And so Morton. We're not sure if he lives in his house for a little while or if he visits with him, but he comes to talk to him on about the 1st of September, 1846. And Jackson says, why don't you try basically ether, right? A very small, simple molecule. Try breathing ether. Maybe that would work. And he goes home and he tries it on his goldfish, he tries it on his wife's dog. He tries it on various creatures. It seems to work. When they breathe it, they lie insensible on the ground breathing, and then they wake up a little while later. Long story, he tries it on himself, of course, holding a watch, sniffing ether from a, a rag, and wakes up eight minutes later. Lucky he didn't kill himself. Uh, but. That's, that's our, our friend. And Jackson, meanwhile, is going on having terrible fights. He was on a boat with Samuel Morse, who's a famous inventor of this time. May, maybe you heard of the Morse code. He invented the electromagnetic telegraph. But he and Jackson were both coming back to the States from Europe aboard the ship Sully. And he fought the Morse patent, claiming he had told Morse about the Morse code. And, 
ele electromagnetic things and whatnot. So he has a problem. He invents everything. <coughs> but it wasn't believed by the world. Well, here, here's our hero. He's tried it on himself. He then is up on Beacon Hill, and he, we think he, he basically tries it on about 10 or 15 patients. The first patient was the grocer, who comes in with a rotten tooth. He's just anesthetized himself. He lets the grocer breathe it. He pulls the grocer, grocer's tooth, and the, the grocer wakes up a few minutes later and says, when are you going to pull my tooth? And he said, perfect. It's working. And then they start advertising in the Boston newspaper, painless dentistry, come up and get your tooth pulled. Meanwhile, down at the Mass General, the young surgeons begin to hear about painless dentistry being done on Beacon Hill. And a number of them start to come up and they ask if they could watch and they watch and they're pretty convinced. So they go to the old man and they say, we gotta try this at the hospital. Who's the old man? John Collins Warren. The Warren family is an old, famous Boston family. Uh, I think the grandpa or the, or the uncle uh, was killed. One was killed over on, uh, on the hill at the beginning of the, the revolution. Another one, co this guy was a, starts Harvard Medical, one started Harvard Medical School in 1788. Uh, and this John Collins is a surgeon, extremely dour, unpleasant man. Uh, you had to be a little dour to cut people's legs off in 90 seconds, you know. He was a tough guy. Here's his picture with his cape and his skull. And they convince him to invite. So they write the letter, you're invited, October 16th, 10.30 in the morning, show up, and you can prove to us that whatever you're doing causes anesthetic states. He calls it lithion. He tries to cover up with oil of orange, and he submits a patent application. Gets him into a lot of trouble with everybody because patent medicines at the time were the things that cured warts and made cancers go away but didn't work. And so he's patenting. He's trying to patent this stuff. Anyway, they let him in. He comes. He brings this gadget that I brought along with you. This this thing, he comes to the Bullfinch building. You all know about Bullfinch, the great Boston architect. He did the ether dome, that dome that they put up on the roof of the Mass General. He also did the nation's capital. After they burned it down, the British came up the river. So he's pretty famous. Sorry. And that's what the MGH looks like. There's the ether dome. This is a postcard I dug up on Beacon Hill from about 1910. It wasn't nearly as surrounded by buildings as it is today. It was a tidal river. They brought this first patient over. They rowed him over from Cambridge. That's before they dammed it. There was a dock over there for the Mass General. They brought him upstairs. And way up on top is where they would cut the legs off in 90 seconds because they didn't want to scare the patients downstairs, right? didn't want to show the terrible things they were doing. And that's the ether dome. And if you ever go up there, and it is open as a museum, you can see where the sun would pass on the ecliptic. People would be in these seats down here. And then they would operate by sunlight or candlelight or something like that. Luckily, sunlight. That's probably why this worked. It probably would have exploded and burned otherwise if there were flames nearby. This is what we think it looked like. This is an early drawing of the event. Morton comes rushing up the stairs. He's had this produced the night before. He was trying to patent the device and invention as well. Put the ether down in the hole there. This is the inspiratory port here. This is the expiratory port here. There are little flap valves. You breathe in, the gas comes in, passes over the ether, which is down in the bowl here. You inhale it, it's uptake through your lungs, it goes to your brain, it puts your brain to sleep. You exhale the exhausted gas out the side. Not a bad invention done by Chamberlain and some instrument makers here in town. They were trying to make science very popular so everybody would do it. Sorry. And the first painting we really have of the scene was done about 50 years later in Paris, 
by Hinckley. It's the famous one. There's the Hinckley painting. The patient had a vascular tumor beneath his jaw, and we're at 165 years post this demonstration. I was chief of anesthesia at 150 years, and we had another painting done, a much better one, an R-rated one. And we got to pose for that, so there we are. I'm playing Morton here with an ether vaporizer under me. And this is this wonderful painting, and you should go see it if you possibly can. It was done by Warren Prosperi. It hangs in the ether dome. You get a much better view. There's blood in this, so it's R-rated. There's the vascular tumor. Someone is tying the tumor. And it was amazing, because he was about 20 minutes late. And John Collins Warren there in the gray hair was really a, a little nonplussed by that. He really didn't like that idea that this inventor came late to show his invention, but by God, it worked. And at the, et, at the end, he said, this is no humbug. This is the real thing. So if the humbug went down, you knew you were doing the right thing. And I love this part because he goes to England well, it goes to England, the invention. So the invention is done here, and he anesthetizes this day at the Mass General Morton, then he does the next day, another minor operation. Then they get into a squabble with the Mass General over whether there's a patent, whether the MGH will be allowed to use this patent, whether the MGH will have to pay. Finally, they decide after a big huddle, he agrees to let MGH use it free. And use ether, and pretty much everybody knows it's ether. It, the oil of orange, you can't cover ether. Those of you who ever remember walking through a hospital where they used ether, you walked in the door and you knew they were using ether. It smells. And so he, the hospital let them do an amputation on November 1st. On December 1st, in the New England Journal of Medicine, they published the, the report of the use of ether to do a capital amputation, taking a leg off. In the New England Journal, there was a steamer. The Cunard Line had the mail route to London, to England, from, from Boston. And they put the New England Journal on that with some letters that said, we've done this in Boston. It really works. You should look at it. It's, and so in England, which is the, the father of this colony, right? And that's where the science was done. That's where Davy, they were the important reviewers of this. This, stuff, this idea shows up in the journal. It's done first in Scotland, where they pull a tooth. And the second place to do it was this gentleman, who was the most famous surgeon in all of England, Robert Liston. And gentlemen, this is no Yankee dodge. So a dodge is a clever plan in Old English, I'm told. This is no Yankee clever plan, and this sure beats mesmerism. The French had this technique. Mesmer, actually, was a sweet, he was a Swiss who would anesthetize you. It took you tw by hypnotizing you. It took him 24 hours to get you ready for surgery, and then you went and hypnotized. But it obviously didn't work very well. So Liston, this very strong man who could cut legs off in 90 seconds, then had time to tie the artery, prepare the skin flap, do a decent job. It changed the world. London then went completely over to using this, and really it went around the world. It took about another, I know about France, the French were awfully fussy, and they took almost another year to uh, take up anesthesia. Obviously it was the right thing to do for humans and patients, but it wasn't at all clear. And I bring up, as always, those of you who follow medicine and the arts, this is a picture, the first picture we have of an anesthetic. It's at the Mass General Hospital. It's before Listerian antisepsis. Nobody's washing their hands, wearing gloves, putting on sterile, sterile anything. They're all wearing their dirty clothes. Here's John Collins Warren over here. Uh, John Dalton, the first American professor of physiology ever, is the anesthetist. At the end there, he's a young surgical house officer became the first professor of physiology in the world. He's an extraordinary guy. And obviously, they're, they're not using that widget that I brought here. They're just using rags and ether to, to anesthetize with. This is the first picture we have of it. 
Everybody got into it in Boston. We knew it was our invention. We knew it was our town. We knew we were doing science. We knew we had inventors. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, the poet, the father of the judge who in 1903 goes to the Supreme Court, his son, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. This is Oliver Wendell Holmes, the father. And he writes in the New England Journal, actually it was in the Boston Globe or the New England Journal, everybody wants to have a hand in the great discovery. All I want to do is give you a hint or two as to names. It was called etherizing. We etherized people. Didn't think that was a good enough name for us the technique or the specialty, and he said, I will give you a name for it. Let's take it from the Greek, aesthesia, sensibility. Let's make it anesthesia or insensible versus etherization. So he named us. And then there was this big fight between who did it, and if you go to the Mount Auburn Cemetery, which is the perfect follow-up to this talk, go to the Mount, Mount Auburn in the spring, You'll see Morton's grave, and on his grave it says, inventor and revealer of anesthetic inhalation, born, blah, blah, blah. There are other little things. Nikki was kind enough, my wife, to take this photograph. And then if you go to Jackson's tomb, tombstone, you have the dueling tombstone, the opposite. Jackson, uh, eminent chemist, mineralogist, geologist, investigator in all departments of natural science. I love that through his observations of the peculiar effects of sulfuric ether on the nerves of sensation and his bold deduction therefrom the benign discovery of painless surgery. When Jackson saw Morton's grave, he died, Morton died quite young of heat stroke in Central Park in New York. At the age of about 50, he went mad, they said. He just went nuts on his grave, became insane, and went to McLean and spent the rest of his life in McLean until he died and had his tombstone made. The fight goes on. So ether is still used uh, in parts of the world. It's been pretty much surpassed in the first world. Uh, it burns. I used, I think I did 100 ether cases as a resident at the Mass Journal in the 70s. So it went on from 1846 to the 70s, about 130 years. It was used. It was very potent. It was hard to kill people with it. It was a really safe anesthetic. It got you quite deep. It did the job, and it worked for 130 years here. We stopped using it in about 78 because it burned, and we didn't want to pay all that insurance, fire insurance money, so we cut it out, and then we had halothane and isophorane and all the, the fluorinated hydrocarbons that are kind of fluorinated ethers uh, that work better although they still used it. Now, the English were always a problem for us, I think, even at this time. And I just bring this up because I think they influenced our history so much. Uh, first, this drives me crazy a little bit. There was a guy by the name of Crawford Long who used ether mainly on slaves in Georgia in 1842. He never published. He never told anybody about it. He then spoke about it after the... New England Journal paper, and Morton used it. So probably he was the first, and somehow the senator from Georgia must have convinced the United States government, because there's a stamp in 1840 celebrating Crawford Long, the inventor. But in reality, it's one thing to invent, it's another thing to prove to the world. And to Morton, we give the honor of proving that ether anesthesia worked versus doing it and not telling anyone. Uh, this great fight went on here in Boston and Oliver Wendell Holmes, and if you go to the Boston Common, you'll see this wonderful statue. We are the only city in the world with a statue to anesthesiology in the public park. And it was raised by conscription, I don't know, 6,800 bucks. Uh, and there was this big fight going on over, was it Jackson, was it Morton, was it Long, was it Wells, you know, those are the four contenders. And there are tons of books written on this. And Oliver Wendell Holmes in the Boston Globe at the time said, you can consider it a tribute to ether or either of the inventors. <laughs> and of course the English, they had a problem. They loved ether, it worked. I showed you, Liston used it in London. 
but they had problems. You coughed a lot. It was irritating, and it burned. And England was ahead of us in the Industrial Revolution. They had tenements. They had lots of fires and lots of houses and lots of people stacked on them. And if you were a general practitioner and they called you for a breach lady trying to deliver a ba baby feet first on the fifth floor of a tenement in London, you went up there with your ether, you poured ether, you anesthetized the lady, and woof, you know, the stove set off the whole house and the house burned down. So a flammable anesthetic wasn't perfect for England. We were behind. We weren't really in tenements yet. So it was OK in the States. And so this wonderful, crazy Scottish inventor, James Young Simpson, would invite people to dinner. And after dinner, they would all inhale everything in the pharmacist's cabinet. And he eventually, one day, got to chloroform. And he called it chlory. And uh, when he woke up the next morning, <laughs> <laughs> he said that might work, and in fact it did work, and the English went very quickly to chloroform. And so there were chloroform ether wars, which was better. In fact, chloroform, because it makes free radical, takes out one in every 1,500 people who breathe it by hepatic necrosis. We didn't figure that out because so many people died from disease and surgery for a long time. So it went away, chloroform, 50, 75 years later. But it was used commonly in Britain. And I bring it up because there's a little more of a story here, which I think was very important for women. The church came out against the use of anesthesia. Interesting. The Anglican church said, if you read the Bible, it says you come into the world in pain and tears. What do you mean you guys are going to take away the pain and the tears? That's wrong. It's against the Bible. So there was a vigorous reproach to the use of anesthesia and anesthesiology by the church. And... Uh, especially for women. They were kind of low down on the totem pole, and uh, you weren't supposed to use it for uh, childbirth. It would be too dangerous, whatever nonsense you had. But then Queen Victoria comes along, and she's delivered six children at this point, and she doesn't like the idea of the pain of childbirth. And so she says to her physician, who was a man by the name of John Snow, who's very famous for the cholera epidemic in London, he was a really smart doc, she said, uh, can I have some of that chlory? Can I have some of that anesthesia stuff? And he says, surely. And of course, he anesthetizes her for the birth of Leopold, who I think was seven and eight and nine or whatever. She had a lot of kids. Uh, and so it was approved after that by the Anglican church. So we have Ether Day at the Mass General every October 16th. I don't want to run over too much here. And uh, it's a neat. It's a neat invention. It changed the world. It changed surgery. It gave surgeons time to do something. For a long time, anesthesia was practiced by the dumbest surgeon or the most inept surgeon or the one with the worst fingers. And then they eventually realized when they wanted to get into the heart and the chest to operate, it couldn't be that way any longer. And so after the Second World War, the American Society of Anesthesiologists was formed, 1950. And at that point, it was realized that a nurse or the dumbest surgeon shouldn't be the one to anesthetize, that if you wanted to do exciting surgery, you had to have somebody smart who would keep the patient alive through the surgery. And so with cardiac surgery, thoracic surgery, and the development of anesthesia in these last 65, 61 years, there's been extraordinary advances. But it all goes back to ether. It all goes back to an amazing invention in Boston. I think I'm going to quit there, take any questions you have, and I hope you've enjoyed the talk. And we're just going to ask as the questions are going to wait for the microphone so that it can get on the recording. Uh, my question is, uh, if this was developed in 1840s, why wasn't it in common use during the Civil War? The question is, I believe, if this was developed in the 1840s, why wasn't it commonly used in the Civil War? It was. It was used, ether was used in the Mexican-American War for the first time. And in fact, quite a bit. Uh, and then it was used in the Civil War. And Morton himself anesthetized 2,000 patients. 
Morton got a wagon and got ether and went down and anesthetized 2,000 patient, patients. Probably there weren't enough anesthetists, there weren't enough physicians as always, but they did do 2,000, Morton himself did 2,000 cases in the Civil War. I didn't want to get into the, a lot of the post-invention history, but it had a long and complex history. I'm trying to remember, since I've had a couple of surgeries at Mass General, but way, way back, um, when I was quite young, I seem to remember breathing in something. Was that the ether that they would have given back in, let's see, I was born in 47, so 52, 53? Very, very probably. We used ether, we used cyclopropane, another gas at the time, which was very potent. Uh, it had certain had certain other bad effects. It had a more rapid induction. It also had nausea and vomiting as a side effect. And as we used to say, if you had a fire, ether blew you into the wall, cyclopropane blew you through the wall. There was so much energy in that ring. So chemi chemically, it was even more dangerous. So what is it they're now putting into your veins when you? <laughs> well, as after the war, we we used short-acting barbiturates as an induction agent. So you didn't have to smell the vapors of ether. We gave you a sleep dose of a barbiturate, which unfortunately all the barbiturates are quite depressant. So they depress your, your brain and your peripheral vascular system. So we would induce you with, pro, with pentothal and then have you breathe. After you were asleep from the barbiturate, we'd use another drug, ether and we'd use ether to carry you through the surgery, and then you'd blow off the ether at the end. It was a wonderful analgesic. It gave wonderful post-operative analgesia. It was very fat-soluble, so you breathed it for a couple of days. Your, if your parents came to see you, in the, and they would say, gee, we can smell you, we could smell ether. And when I used to come home after doing ether anesthetics, my wife said, you used ether today. I said, right, you know, because we pick it up as anesthesiologists and exhale it as well. It was probably, I would say, the majority of cases were ether, barbiturate ether, and then curare and the relaxants came up after the war, some argument about how safe they were, and then curare came in, and then all the modern drugs that are derived from those agents. So that's probably what you had. What are we doing today? Today we're doing much fancier things. We've, I mean, uh, like we use propofol uh, instead of the, the barbar barbiturate induction agents. We use a lot of regional anesthesia. We use more modern uh, vapors that uh, have very rapid inductions uh, that don't have the, as much nausea and vomiting as, and we use anti-nausea and vomiting agents. We have a whole array of things in the pharmaceutical cabinet Together, used together, they're very safe. I mean, I would guess in Morton's day we were killing quite a number. I wouldn't, I wouldn't promise. There are no data as to how many people died with the anesthetic, but probably we get a good fraction of surgical mortality. When I started my anesthesia residency, numbers from 1 to 500 to 1 to 5,000 killed by the anesthetics were not uncommon. We think anesthesia has gotten so safe because of monitoring and better drugs primarily and more skillful anesthetists. Uh, we're something like one in 250,000 we're willing to say we did it. So our mortality rates are one, way down and our insurance rates are way down. Whereas uh, neurosurgeons and others at the high end, obstetricians might pay 50 or $100,000 a year for insurance to practice medicine. Anesthesiologists are down around nine or 10,000, about the level a primary prayer care practitioner pays for uh, malpractice insurance. So it is safe. I could have made an entirely different lecture, but I just decided in this room, you had to go back 150 years. It, it, it was your sentence for coming. Um, I just had a question. Last week or so, they had a talk about the architecture, and I assume it was called the Bullfinch Dome when it was first built. 
And I'm sure they don't use it now, or is it they held cultural events there? Is it still accessible? Is it all glass still covered over, just a big gold thing no. now? <laughs> no, the Ether Dome is still used. I tried to get up there yesterday with a visitor, and we got inside. Uh, I think it's supposed to be open between 8 and 4 or 9 and 4. I'm not sure it always is. I couldn't get in between 9 and 4 yesterday. Even though it, but it's used a lot for lectures. It's a great place. It's a little uncomfortable like this. It probably there's a pretty hard seat to sit on. But yes, the sun still goes through the ecliptic slot, although the louvers may not be in the right position at that time. We don't call it the Bullfinch Dome. We call it the Ether Dome. I don't know when that happened, but probably a long time ago. It, was prob it reeked of ether, certainly was used as the operating room well into the 20th century. Now there are 70 operating rooms, not looking like that room. I should be tempted to ask you which of the four candidates is your favorite horse in the race for being the father of ether. Pardon me. But let me ask you another question instead. Uh, it was almost found to work by accident. Sometime many eras later, somebody actually determined the medical mechanism by which it got from the lungs basically to anesthetize somebody. Who, who were the researchers that found out how it worked? Ah, uh, I wish I could tell you. I, I would say, the question is, who were the researchers who figured out how ether worked? Well, let me say, I, I think to this day, we're not terribly, terribly, 100% certain how anesthetic vapors work. Uh, I wish I could say more. There's a gentleman who works, his laboratory is next to mine, Keith Miller. Uh, he still has grants from NIH on how <laughs> anesthetics work. So mechanisms of anesthesia are still not truly certain. Some of them are better known, ketamine and GABA receptors. Some of our drugs are better known, but the vapors, uh, not so sure. People are still researching it. Do they work on channels? There are interesting lipid, lipid solubility characteristics. It's a long lecture for somebody more skillful than I am in this area. And I'm not sure at the end of the day, if you said, where, do, where does most of ether's effect occur? We know. We know it's in the brain. We know it's centrally. We know it's on neural cells. But exactly how, I don't think we really know. All right, we have time for one last question. Oh, yeah. Uh, speaking of the Civil War, what actually was laudanum? What is laudanum? Laudanum in the Civil War. Well, laudanum is a morphine, is an opiate derivative, so it's morphine. They give you a tincture of laudanum, which was an ethanolic solution of morphine, because it's not terribly, uh, which came from the poppy. And so they would drop, give them a few drops. The problem with morphine is that, like all opiates, the dose depends on you. You can't say 10 drops to someone who's critically ill, who's sick, who's hypotensive, who's shocked. 10 drops in an adult would kill a child, so you have to think about body weight and size. And the, if you were really sick, a little bit of anesthetic would kill you, and a little bit of morphine would kill you. So sizing the dose to the patient size and the degree of illness, age, cardiac output, ventilatory ability, how much are you breathing? It depends on so much. That's why we killed so many until it became a specialty and people could study all this. But that's all post-war. The techniques really were post-war. We still kill people with anesthesia in the Second World War. Uh, I remember my teachers telling me how in Korea, they used ether, and they didn't have enough anesthesiologists in our country, so they would have corpsmen, and they would line the heads up like a, it was like when they brought in 10 soldiers who needed to be anesthetized, you'd have 10 heads, and the bodies would face out. And the surgeons would, they had more surgeons, and they'd work around the bodies, and the one anesthesiologist would stand in the middle, surrounded by several corpsmen, and they'd all be on ether, it was hard to kill people on ether. You couldn't really get them deep enough to stop breathing and lose their blood pressure. 
So we, tend, we used a lot. This is Henrik Mendixson's tale to me uh, as an anesthetist in the Korean War. So uh, into, endotracheal intubation and ether were still, that's 52, right? 54, pretty recent. Thank you very much, Dr. Zapel. You're welcome.